there's a friend of mine, well, he was a friend of mine who passed away. I didn't really see in the lead up to his passing because I was obsessed that he thought crazy things about me, terrible things about me. And they weren't true. They were my head. Sorry to hear that. That's Oh, it's fine. You should like segue like the Benny Hill music into this point just to sort of <laughs> bring some levity to all this. Today's a bit of a personal one for me. I'm going to be talking to... Well, I've already spoken to him and recorded it, actually. But uh, James McMahon, the music journalist and former editor of Kerrang! Music magazine, who also has several prominent roles at NME, which is also a very big music magazine. He's very talented and does all sorts of things from illustration and animal portraits to a paranormal email magazine called Spook and interviews with the likes of Green Day, U2 and 50 Cent. Those are just the most famous, or some of the most famous ones. He's also written for Vice, The Guardian, and The Big Issue, among other prestigious titles. But today, we're going to talk about his struggle with obsessive-compulsive disorder. It's something that I struggled with myself as a teenager and haven't really spoken that much publicly about. Uh, I wouldn't want to say now that I have OCD any more than the average person. Um, I'm sure all of you have some aspects of the obsessive compulsion, but it's the disorder part uh, where people like James come in as, as he as he goes on to say himself so i came across his other projects he's got enough projects doesn't he uh the ocd chronicles in which he interviews all sorts of people with different kinds of ocd which affects everybody slightly differently his latest interview was with mara wilson the child star you might know from matilda or mrs doubtfire I put forward the theory to James that learning to be Matilda, a young girl who can control things with her mind, might have been a catalyst for her disorder. But I think both James and Mara can see that it's a little bit more complicated than that. In any case, we talk about how it has affected James and get onto parts you maybe didn't expect from OCD, including intrusive thoughts. Uh, and there are some surprising and difficult ones that have plagued James for some time. If you think that you or your loved ones might be... God, it sounds like one of those adverts, doesn't it? If you think that you or your... No, it's a serious topic. Come on. If you think that you or your loved ones might be suffering with this debilitating disorder, I've put links to OCD UK and OCD Action in the episode description. So do get in touch with them. Check out James's OCD Chronicles on jamesjammcmahon.com. That's jamesjammcmahon.com. Or follow him on Twitter via... James Jam McMahon. 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 Since you're there, follow me too on andrewgold underscore OK. It's the same for Instagram. Uh, get in touch with your thoughts and also any suggestions for people you'd like me to interview. Um, and I'll see you at the end where I'll read out some reviews. For now though, James was a little late to our meeting, so I got sucked into the YouTube gross video vortex. Um, I was just watching a YouTube thing. I know you're a horror fan. It was uh, the 10 Fates Worse Than Death in movies. No, yeah, I love that stuff. But I do find the older that I get, the less I can do gore. I think that's maybe a mortality thing. God. Yeah, and maybe you start to think about like your family a bit more. Yeah, it is mortality and everything, isn't it? Yeah, because the thing is, is with the paranormal as well. I saw, um, I'm trying to remember his name, mm. Mark Gattis. He like co-wrote uh, that adaptation of Dracula with Stephen Moffat that was on at Christmas, which I thought was amazing. And um, he he makes a really similar point that you know as he gets older and there's kind of like less life ahead of him than what is behind him, he uh, he struggles with gore, but like the supernatural kind of gives him hope in a way. And I think I might be a little bit like that actually. You've got a an email magazine as well, don't you, on the paranormal. Yeah, well, it's good. it's called Spook, and um, it's kind of like about the weird more than just the paranormal, really. I, I mean, I, lo I love all that. I did a documentary for the BBC about an exorcist. You got to watch that. Oh, all right. Yeah, I'm just um, plugging my own stuff on my. Own. No, it's cool. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> it's called Exorcism: The Battle for Young Minds. I met an exorcist in Argentina and sort of hung around with him for a month or so. So I got to take part. I did an exorcism on something. Wow, that's great. Where's your head with it? I mean, do you, do you think there is anything going on, or no, not for me, not for me. I felt that this particular yeah. exorcist was taking uh, was taking advantage of um, like the young women in the area, and right. get, you know that's how the film starts very sort of paranormally, and then gradually delves into the you know who's touching who and why did you get so close to this girl sort of thing. Right, um, right. 
yeah, so it was actually a bit horrific. What about you? Where do you stand on that with exorcism and stuff? Well, no, I, I think the thing is, is if you have like an interest in mental health, I find it quite hard to be on board with the idea of exorcisms because my natural response is these people are ill and they need medical help. I mean, it's weird because, you know, I, I do to a degree believe in something else, but I don't think that, I don't, I don't think that exorcists in the Vatican and organized religion and et cetera, et cetera, have very much to do with it at all, to be honest. So. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think you make a good point about the mental health thing because that's what this guy was, uh, he was taking women who had schizophrenia out of psychiatric wards um, and telling them, no, no, you don't have schizophrenia you've got um you've got a demon inside you and all this kind of thing and the, the funny thing is and uh i suppose this is quite sim- you know similar to what we're going to be talking about with mental health and everything but the funny thing is people do tend to get better after an exorcism that's the surprising thing that we found they do get much better right. for a, a, a limited amount of time presumably which could be from a few months to five years and then right. there's a, there's the moral question of you know if it if it does help you for five years maybe it's worth it because it's it's obviously there's a bit of placebo and suggestion and that it's yeah. a, it's a really intense thing to go through it's like an hour of just like screaming and screaming and people screaming at you and all yeah. the all the godly imagery and stuff so I pitched a few stories on it in in the past mm. but never never able to get by I watched the documentary and just rip it off if that's okay <laughs> please do so here's my subtle segue into the topic of this podcast you do lots of different um things you're an illustrator as well and you know all sorts of journalism is mm. is that part of having an obsessive personality or ocd doing so many different things and trying to trying to do everything i suppose i mean the only problem with that question is that i'm very against the view of there is a positive side to ocd which is what you know my diagnosis is yeah. And what I identify as, you know, I'm part of an OCD support group, and there's quite a high turnover of people who come because, yeah, you know, OCD is far more common than you'd think, and there's not a tremendous amount of support within the NHS. And you know, quite a lot of people come, they tell their stories, and they're horrendous, and I identify with them. It's an illness that I really feel like if you haven't got it, you can't understand it. And I really hope less and less people do understand it because sometimes it blows my mind how cruel it can be. But sometimes people come and they go, oh, well, you know, I like this thing about myself. You know, I, I like how detail oriented I am or I like how much I think about certain things. And for me, I do think those things are part of my personality and they are probably there because of OCD. But the negatives far outweigh them. There's a frustration with a lot of people in the OCD community when people describe themselves as being OCD and what they really mean is they're just tidy yeah. or they're neat. Yeah. And I think that the thing that's always really important to remember is the D in the acronym of disorder that... You know, if it's if it's OCD, then it's something which has a negative impact on your life. I completely agree with you. I struggled with it myself as a teenager. And what frustrated me more than anything else was sort of going into school and I'd had a night where I just didn't sleep the entire night because it was it was really it really got bad. Uh, and I hadn't slept for days. And then it was during this time, I'd, I'm sure you were also frustrated by it. There seemed to be a particular time where it was really popular to have OCD. David Beckham had it, uh, yeah. Paul, Gas- Paul Gascoigne, and it was almost like a sign of being a genius in, in the public uh, the consensus so there was yeah. this like oh yeah I, David Beckham lines up all his coke cans in the fridge that's why he's such a brilliant footballer and that kind of yeah. thing it was a total misunderstanding and it was as you're saying I think it was so offensive because I've just been up like it's not this fun thing of putting your cans in the fridge it was like switching the light switch on and off for about four fucking hours <laughs> uh, and not knowing why I'm doing it I think that's why it's so cruel as well because you're fully conscious of of what's what you're doing and how ridiculous it is sometimes and you can't stop doing it it's, it's interesting actually because I now feel like I've had OCD since being a very small child but I always consider like um, my second year of university of being like the time when it became mm. like really problematic um but i ha- didn't really get proper treatment which you know is always said within um the ocd community is the gold standard being cbt and cognitive behavioral therapy yeah and i think called the exposure response prevention which is putting yourself close to your fears to your obsessions until you basically become bored of them i only really feel like in the last couple of years i really had got the right kind of therapy i i had i've always been quite like a high functioning sufferer 
Um, I've had some like appalling times, some of which people know about, some of which I managed to kind of keep uh, to sort of my private moments. But I've always worked. I've always um, had good jobs, interesting jobs, travelled, held down relationships. But a couple of years ago, I really did like reach a point of no return and, and I had a real crisis really. And that led me to finally getting the right treatment, you know, this OCD support group. And I literally went in there and said to them, like, who's the best therapist for OCD? You know, at that point I was willing to pay whatever. And, um, you know, my parents and my parents in law had said they would help me out. And, I found a guy who's called Dr. David Veal, who's like a real, like super well respected within the OCD community. Uh, he works at the Priory. I went to see him this summer, which has been incredibly intense because of the situation with lockdowns and so on. Yeah, I, I had this CBT. I've really found I have some tools that I feel for the first time proper tools to deal with OCD, but I've learned so much about the origins of it like where I think it came from. And it is that thing of if I would take my mum, if I would take my dad, if I would take my brothers, if I would take where I grew up, the school I went to, I can see how this like cauldron of uh, nurture created this problem. And that's like not blaming anyone. That's just growing up on what you're exposed to. But, I did find myself walking through childhood with the therapist and just being astonished by how much trauma was there and how obvious it was that all that stuff had conspired to create the problems that I've had in adulthood. My mum definitely raised, raised me to be very, very creative. She was always, when I was a child, asking me my opinion on things. Like, yeah. we'd watch something on the news. And I was a child, you know, I was very small. We'd watch something on the news and she'd say, well, what do you think of that, James? You know? So that stuff is without a doubt something which I've carried into my career and so on. I always say that, you know, being a journalist is just about being interested in things. And that's definitely something that they she put in me. At the same time, I also can see facets of my dad's personality or circumstances of things that happened to my family when I was young created a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear and a lot of a feeling of not being safe. Mm. Um, and all those things, I think that, you know, anyone, any therapist who was trained in OCD would say that that's kind of where the disorder comes from, as much as people know, in that. Um, it's almost a way of trying to protect you. It, like, it's your brain malfunctioning, trying to protect yeah. you. That makes a lot of sense to me because I. So for me, if you know, my parents got divorced when I was nine or so, um, and I very much felt like I was the the sort of man of the house with my mum and my my little brother. So from a, it, so that sort of makes sense. From a very young age, I started by sort of doing just little things like checking. Uh, if the gas was on or whatever, and that—that's the one that really drove me crazy. I'd be doing that, you know, all night, going up, and I'd go up to bed, and then I'd, I'd be like, oh, "No, I'm going to go down again." And I'd do this up, and you know, I drove my poor mum insane for five, ten years. It was it sort of, you know, tore us apart a bit. Um, but yeah, checking that, and then it, so it starts that way, and suddenly it's like, "Well, I'm checking the gas. I might as well check the back door, and then the front door, and then it's like, I wonder if the car doors are locked or not." And I'm going out in the snow in the winter, you know, like popping out just in my pajamas to check the doors. Um, and then you start, you know, you're already doing 30 or 40 things on this list. You might as well count the amount of crisps that are in the cupboard. And now I'm going to count this other thing. By the end of the th I had a whole routine of about 100 things I was doing every night. And I had to do it in the right order or I started again. And it was bonkers. And I ended up, I pulled the door handle off my car because I'd pulled it so many times. I was 17, I think. Uh, I'd pulled it so many times over the previous year just to check it was locked. I didn't. Be you don't believe your own brain, do you? Um, yeah, yeah. Just keep checking and checking and checking. It's like, I know that's locked. But as soon as, I've, as soon as the physical sensation in my hand of I've just pushed, I've just held the door handle has gone away, my brain's going, but did I really just check that? I don't know if I checked that. I'm going to check again. That kind of thing. It's, it's just bonkers. I mean, how does it, how does it manifest itself uh, for you? Because it's different with everyone, isn't it? I think that it's uh, the OCD is this is based on no research whatsoever. This is my kind of gut and intuition, but I think that it it grows unless 
it's dealt with as soon as possible. And I think that that's problematic because there is there, there is a fact that OCD UK say right on the front of their homepage about the length of time between diagnosis and getting the proper help. Or, or like the length of time that OCD can be a problem before it's diagnosed and then there's an even there's a super long time before they find the right treatment and i think that you know when i was a kid when i was a little kid i was obsessing about things which almost seem quite quaint to me now is that cupboard shut or is that drawer shut or um and maybe things that were a bit darker but still things i wouldn't have identified as OCD at the time or, or for many years later, which which was things like I was obs- I couldn't stop feeling terrified of death when mm. I was very young. Okay. Um, and, you know, and then I can kind of go back to my time as a teenager and I can go, well, you know, I thought some very, very paranoid things about family members or um, people I knew um, I always thought people were out to get me or, you know, would obsess about that. And then I kind of get to university and I, it all became very much about contamination and um, sort of uh, medical issues. And then I kind of get in my mid-20s and um, it's much more about rumination and kind of obsessing about things in the past and um, how I would have liked to have done things differently. And, you know, the thing with that stuff is that I can still – almost dis- at the time I could almost go, well, you know, everyone's got regrets or um, as a teenager, I could go, well, you know, everyone's a bit paranoid or, you know, with the contamination stuff, you know, people would say things like hypochondria to me, you know, and it was only really when things got very bad and I got, um, I basically, I got a diagnosis of OCD in 2008 and I was right in the middle of working at the NME and it was my dream job. And I was really, really trying to like soak up everything from it and everything that I'd ever wanted from it. And I just didn't accept it because, you know, as we were discussing before, like the cultural understanding of um, society's understanding of OCD is, is is so far from what it really is. So I said to myself, well, you know, you should see my flat. Like there's no way I've got OCD, you know, almost not knowing that, you know, hoarding kind of comes under, um, you know, the umbrella of associated disorders I mean, it's like you say sort of about your your, your mother. It's an, it's an awful, awful illness for people who are around people with OCD. And one of the biggest turning points in my life was, my, was me and my wife, which was seven years ago. And um, she, from the very off, our first date, I basically talked about having OCD. And, you know, by our second date, she'd gone away and read up a lot of things about it. And, oh. I just thought that was the sweetest thing. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, we've really kind of been on this journey together and, you know, kind of learning more about it so that we can support each other. In in the wake of where I am today, there's so many ruined Christmases and family get-togethers and, you know, dints on the bathroom wall where I would be banging my head against it because I was just so frustrated by people not understanding how difficult it was. Like, there's so much collateral damage that comes with it. Would you be able to sort of uh, give me an example of, of an event that was just horrific because of OCD? I'm just thinking for people listening who have... I could very easily, and I, I have no shame with it, go, oh, you know, I had this obsession that people thought I was a serial killer, which which was a thing, you know. I had some, For some time, I was obsessed that people thought I was a serial killer, you know. So, so your mind would tell you they think I'm going to... They think I've been killing people. No, more that they would look at me and go, oh, he's capable of being a serial killer. You know that that was one. You know, so but there, and I could I could list every. I mean, I could list so many themes and obsessions. My kind of my real feeling about OCD is like the sort of content doesn't matter as much as like the broken cognitive process. I used to go see a talking therapist and just talk about this stuff, and they would say, "Well, why do you think that is?" And I would go, "Well, you know, I've always kind of been interested in true crime, and there are things from my childhood that probably." Hmm led to me being interested in true crime, you know? But it isn't about that. It It's the thing that makes me check door handles, which I don't do anymore, but I did do a lot in the past, is the same as obsessing that people think I might be a serial killer. 
like, and that's one of the things that I think is really misunderstood about OCD. With my parents, for example, I think there was a period of time where they just thought I was withdrawn or that I was sullen. And really, it was I was fighting World War Three in my head. And there's a natural distance which, you know, is put between you and someone when that's going on. I've had girlfriends in the past say to me that, you know, I, I don't really feel like you're in the room. And, um, you know, I probably wasn't in the room. I was physically, but, you know, mentally I was somewhere else. So, um, but, you know, even things like, and this is one of the things I've, I've really kind of learned this summer with therapy is that because it's gone on so long, there's so much about my personality that I feel has been shaped by OCD. I really am one of the most life-loving, positive, enthusiastic people that anyone could ever meet like every day is an adventure and i'm also really um driven and strong um uh, and that's definitely you know the influence of my mum um so i've never really had depression i have huge sympathies for people who do but i've never really had that um i've seen people who are depressed and i just think it's a, like a fog you know it's like but I have found myself in my life sometimes being more needy or more more irritable or I mean there's there's friendship I mean there's friendships with people who have been ruined because of OCD you know like there's a friend of mine well he was a friend of mine who passed away I didn't really see like in the lead up to his passing because um, I was obsessed that he thought you know, crazy things about me, terrible things about me. And they weren't true. They were my head and things like that are very hard to uh, sit with, you know? Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. That's, that's a... Oh, it's fine. Put the, you, should, you should like segue like the Benny Hill music into this point just to sort of <laughs> bring some levity to all the... You know, it's a sad topic. It's, it's interesting what you say about the serial killer thing. <clears throat> on, a, on a complete side note, I've been... I've been uh, interviewing one of the i've done an interview on the podcast actually with a, a pedophile and one of the things i've learned i'm sure you know this already it was in a vice article that was linked to your website as well um, um that it's very common for people with ocd to believe they might be pedophiles um when or when they're not or to believe that other people think they are <clears throat> so i went and spoke to a therapy uh, i mean i live in berlin i went and spoke to them about this and they said they actually have to do tests on pedophiles who come into the therapy and say they are pedophiles they have to test that they're actually attracted to children because a surprising a surprising amount of them are just people with very strong ocd who are convinced that they are or that they would be or would be perceived to be pedophiles and that's very similar to the uh, serial killer analogy that you, that you had well i mean i mean it's strange, really, because, you know, it again, it's one that I've had, you know. Mm. I, I've never had, um, I've never thought I was, but I've been obsessed that people would, might think I was. Yeah, And walking past the school. I think that OCD, like common themes within OCD, and without a doubt, paedophilia is what, I mean, that was when I met some more people within like, the OCD community, it was just so much relief to meet other people and you would never in a million years think that it was a fear or it was a you know it, it was an obsession or a worry or whatever a rumination it was just it was just such a relief to me that i burst into tears because it felt like the top of a you know, very tight jam jar coming loose or something the common themes with an ocd are inspired by like the societal obsessions of the age so, for example, my the first OCD I ever had that was a real, uh, that it was more than a worry. It was that I had AIDS, uh, or I was HIV positive, which again is like more common than you would ever believe. The be the belief that you have it, yeah, yeah, and yeah. that took a year of my life, and I didn't know what OCD what OCD was then. So I was doing all the things you shouldn't do, like looking for reassurance and going for tests to reassure me and. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I can't even remember how many tests I crammed into a year, but people at the gum clinic were looking at me and going, you again? And I would literally yeah. think, well, I've had a test. Uh, I've got the results. What if the person who has tested my blood got it wrong? Or yeah. what if they got the my vial of blood mixed up with someone else's? Yeah. Or, 
you know, just craziness. And for me, it was uh, appendicitis for me. I was <laughs> convinced my anytime slight stomach ache, slight. And even if I didn't have a stomach, my dad, my dad would say, like, Come, don't be ridiculous. You'd be on the floor in pain if you had appendicitis. But my thought was always, yeah, but it's got to start somehow. It's not going to go from zero to 10 in a second. So for me, it was oh, like, man. I must be at the one now and I'm going to get up to two, three, four, five, up to 10 soon. Every lump on my body as well. Like, oh, every, yeah. like the, the themes and the obsession has got so much more traumatizing after that that I'm almost feel sort of slightly wistful about, oh, I've got a lump. I need to book a test or, or whatever. I gather maybe you don't want to go into detail. Maybe it, it might be triggering, and I don't want to push you in that direction anyway. No, 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 no. I, well, I guess for people listening, like, it's hard to imagine much worse than constantly worrying about a lump or having AIDS or being, a, you know, so how can we explain how dark it did get? Well, I think I think this is what I'm trying to say, you know, almost about the paedophilia thing, you know, like okay, yeah. in, in the in the noughties, you know, it was like, like society is obsessed with paedophilia, you know, like, you know, you would read stories about, you know, paediatricians being attacked by brain mobs, they thought they were attacking paedophiles and and yeah. that stuff what ocd does is it finds your biggest fear i think it i think it's somewhere between your biggest fear your moral code and i think there's probably something going on chemically with you as well i mean this is the thing with ocd is that no one really knows where it kind of comes from like there's just theories like there's no confirmed this is why people have ocd and why some people do some people don't for example Everyone has intrusive thoughts. Like that's been proven. Yeah. But with people with OCD, they don't pass through. Um, they stick around. A friend of mine once described my brain as being like a like stones in like stones that were too big to fall down a grate. Um, and I, which was, I mean, he was a writer. Like that's a very <laughs> spot on evocative image. But no, I, I've never met, and I might, I'm, I may be proved wrong, but I've never met anyone with OCD that I wouldn't say was a very decent person. I'm mm. sure I'm sure that can't be the case, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. with everyone who has OCD because the ratios would suggest otherwise. But I, everyone I've ever met has been so kind, so empathetic, and normally very intelligent. And what that is, is that if you obsess, people think that you're a paedophile. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's inside a paedophile's mind. But I think that if you worry about something that's almost a sign that you're not that thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, I get that. The interesting thing about the actual paedophiles who I met is, although it's so funny, actually, because this is... So I have a similar mindset to you. I'm worried everyone thinks I'm everything and that I am everything. Before I even knew what paedophilia was, the thing I didn't want to be in the 90s was gay, which is which right. is horrific, but it's just that's what it was at the time. You know, I No, was which, which again is a super common one. Yeah, when I was 11 or 12, I was like, well, I'm definitely, if anyone's going to be gay, it's going to be me. So it, it's so crazy. But but because I think the way I do, when I've interviewed lots of different actual paedophiles, they start saying things like they purposely do surround themselves with children. Not These are non-offenders. These are people who say, I would never offend, but I do surround myself with children because I want to be around them so much and I need to be around them. And, I, and it's so funny because I always say, yeah, but surely surely you want to not be around them because you don't want to offend or whatever and that's because i don't have whatever sexuality or attraction that they have which for them is irresistible so unless you do find yourself you know trying to be around children so so nearly all the ones i met they, they say i would never offend and yet they are constantly or often around children they are teachers a lot of the time they are um carers babysitters all these kinds of things even when they would never offend uh so so yeah i think you're completely right that like you know is somebody who worries about those things as you say is, is probably not that thing it's always been what if people think you know my thing is i i have a, i have an obsession with the idea of like shame you know which yeah. I, I think is a core theme but when i've met people who have obsessed they might be one which is actually kind of hard for me to even me having the disorder is kind of hard for me to sit within that mindset because I've never had anything like that. Mm. But they come to my support group and they cry and they wail and they shake because it's the most abhorrent thing anyone could possibly think about you. And the idea that this thought has crept inside your brain, not a thought of doing anything, but a thought of maybe this is what my lot in life will be. I mean, 
I'm a writer and I think I'm a good writer. And I don't think I could actually really explain the horror of that to someone to try and help them understand. Um, for example, with the serial killer thing, this is like before I knew anything about the proper treatment for OCD, but I was kept going for many years by my mum who would basically, you know, in her Yorkshire tones, like sit on the end of the phone in the early hours of the morning and just tell me to keep going and tell me I was strong and tell me I was brave and she was proud of me and I, and that kind of kept me going. And But at the same time, if you said to someone, oh, I'm really worried that this person thinks that I'm a serial killer, well, they, they go, well, you're not, so get over it. But it was so, it was so vivid to me. What was it, what was it about you that, that you thought people would look at you and go, because I, you know, I'm looking at you now and you, you, you look like a lovely man. So, so, and that's it. <laughs> um, so, so what- Ted Bundy was a handsome guy. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Which, which just shows that anyone can look like anything, can't they? I mean, what was it you thought people were picking up on that, that had a serial killer vibe? I think at some point when I was younger, I decided that people don't tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I have to find an alternative way to find out what people are really thinking. Mm -hmm. So I became obsessed with eyebrows. I became obsessed with um, blinking. I became obsessed with these like nonverbal cues. Wow. If I would speak to someone and I would say something, if they blinked, that would be confirmation that they weren't telling me the truth. I mean really that way madness lies and you know even see you know i'm i am so much better in that regard there's other stuff that is as bad as ever mm. but in that regard i'm so much better but even speaking to you on zoom you know i'm looking at your face and going mm. oh, i wonder what that meant wonder what that meant wonder what that meant and okay. that's exhausting you know i'm quite conscious now of my <laughs> well i actually i went for a um I went for an interview with, uh, not an interview, like a, just a chat, a coffee with a, an editor, a newspaper who I was trying to get some work off. And I met him mm. and he had the most fair eyebrows of anyone I've ever met. Like they, they were just wisps right. of hair. And I was like, how am I going to work out what this guy really thinks? Because I can't read his eyebrows, you know? God. And I mean, like then that you just look to the left. So like, if you look to the left. That's my right. Oh, okay. That's all right then. I think that I read once that if your eyes go to the left, that's using the creative part of your brain. So therefore, that could be where a lie is being concocted. Yeah. I mean, this is this. I mean, I'm hearing myself say this and going, "God, you were, you were just no, out. no. I get it. Though. No, no, I it. it really was. And not yeah. honestly, like I think it's good for me to actually look at, look at it and go. I mean, that was just so unhealthy, you know. And it, yeah. and it really, it really was. And actually, to be honest. Loads of my friends don't even know that about me. Like, I'm quite open about this stuff. I basically kind of reached a bit of a point in my career where, A, I couldn't keep it to myself any much longer. Like, I just was going to burst. Yeah. You know, it was like, I am so unhappy with this. I can't keep it to myself. I have to share this. But also, yeah. and this might sound slightly arrogant, you know, I really do come from a place, where, you know, a, a town, a village, a an education system that really didn't expect me to do very much and I've done a lot of things that I wanted to do when I was younger and I kind of reached a bit of a point where I was like you know what like if I can help someone who was me when I was 19 go I'm not losing my mind this is an illness I mean there's just nothing I don't know whether you saw actually George Ezra you know George Ezra who's George Ezra he's a very he's a very popular singer okay. my, mom's a, my mom's a big fan yeah. Uh, I think, I think yeah. he won a Brit. I think okay. he won a Brit. I know Ezra Pound. But he, I think he was an anti-Semite, Ezra Pound. Yeah, no, let's just make this very clear. George Ezra is not an anti-Semite. <laughs> Ezra Pound, I think, was that. Yeah, but he's not George Ezra. So No, but I, I, now, I now know to avoid Ezra Pounds if I ever see him down the shops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, no, George Ezra recently talked about how he'd been diagnosed with OCD mm. and... I was immediately skeptical. Oh, here we go. David Beckham, whatever. Yeah. But I heard him talk about it. The guy knows it. The guy has experienced things that, like I say, I would hope that no one would. 
And I feel really sorry for him. But at the same time, it was so big. Like, someone with that profile being that open about OCD. I mean, if I'd had that when I was 19, I can't even explain how seismic that would have been for me. I wrote a piece for The Independent, again, actually, uh, about musicians who were starting to talk about their OCD. And uh, it was just such a joyous piece to write, thinking, oh, maybe other young people, other young people, I'm 40, maybe young people won't have to suffer in yeah. the same way that maybe I did. How did you, you know what, I need to charge my sort of laptop one second. Just, it is the, yeah, no worries. Oh. Good thing I was wearing uh, uh, shorts and not just in my boxes just now because I got up. Oh, um, mate. <laughs> Again, I had a thing the other day where I was talking to some mates and I forgot that I was just wearing pants. And uh, this is, again, with OCD, like, I think people would worry about that for an hour, two hours. Yeah. But I was 48 hours, and it wasn't just, oh, that's embarrassing. It was, oh, my God, what if my friends think that I am a flasher? What if my friends think that I am? You know what I mean? Like, just my brain doing everything it can to conspire against me. I think, you know, it's so funny you say that, because I relate 100% to that. And it's something that that is difficult sometimes for my girlfriend to, to live with because there will be things that either she says or there'll be things that recently I was in the lift in the in where we live and I said something that wasn't it wasn't nice to someone. But I didn't mean it. It was only after when I got out I thought, "Oh no, he might take it that other way." And that me that looks like I was laughing at him about something. And yeah, days Days and days of every every time I got a spare moment, a spare second, that came thought came back to me of just like, oh God, he's going to think I'm just a horrible person. And I think a lot more than most people would worry about that. How did you, you know, you know it was so obvious that, you know, when you were younger, you, that it was OCD. Like how, how did it go away or become manageable? It's very strange. It's very difficult to say exactly because um, I have a terrible memory. Terrible, terrible for somebody who is considers himself to be quite compulsive and obsessive you know but the you know the main parts of ocd obviously um what does compulsive even mean um <laughs> but but yeah uh i don't really remember but it was it was worse when i was probably from the ages of about 14 to 17 my mum sent me to a therapist uh i imagine it was i think it was nhs actually it might have been private i don't know I don't know. And I was seeing this guy. Again, I don't know how long it was, but it could have been a few months. And he dealt with it, funnily enough, differently to how, how with yours, it was it was not looking into my past. It was not really looking into like this and that. And it was almost like I wanted to speak about that because I'd seen so many sort of TV programs and movies where everyone's just like, well, you know, this and that. And it's a very, um, um, it's a cathartic feeling being told, ah, this is why you are because this yeah. happened and that happened. Uh, but he didn't want to go there at all. He was very structural about it. And he basically got me to write this list of everything I do every night, uh, like write all of it down. And he said, he sort of, I don't think it's very healthy. And I've been told by a therapist since then that what he did wasn't necessarily, uh, it was a short-term fix, sort of paper over the cracks. He sort of got me to become obsessed with not being obsessive. Uh, he was sort of saying, right, you've got to obsess now over getting one of these things of the 40 off the list this week. And the next week, another thing off the list. And I became obsessed to the point that, for example, I used to always make sure the door was shut in my bedroom. I'd keep pulling on it to make sure it was shut. And the, this week's challenge was it has to always be open. I can't go to sleep with it closed. It has to be open. You know, so I was obsessing over that. And I guess somewhere in my mind, it somewhere subconscious, some subconscious part of me sort of began to understand the, the ridiculousness of all of this. I mean, how long, how long ago was that? I'm 31 now, so this was about 14 years ago. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I maybe didn't explain mine so well, actually. I think that the putting things together hmm. was a very, very small part of mine. And actually, what I have had isn't actually a million miles away from what you had. It's just, uh, and again, it's that kind of OCD puro distinction, which I don't really like, but there is a kind of a difference. What is, what is that? Well, pure O. Pure O is really the idea of OCD, but without physical compulsions and rituals. So mm -hmm. it's like the compulsions are in your head. So you're still doing the same thing of trying to find relief, 
mm. flicking the light switch on and off, whatever. But you're doing it by trying to re- reassure yourself for, you know, reassurance, which is like the enemy of OCD because it keeps it going, it fans the flames. Okay. P- this idea of pure O has kind of become quite common in recent years. And I actually think that it's kind of good to be able to make the distinction between physical check-in, physical compulsions and internal ones. Mm. However, I actually think that OCD is all the same. So I think that actually separating them out is probably a bit yeah. a bit problematic, really. It's just kind of a buzzy term right now and has been for a few years. Right. But actually what you're saying, the thing with the draw, that's actually not a million miles away from what I had because I think that that is really what we would call exposure. So it's the idea of you sitting with something, like the idea of you not doing the thing that makes uh, the anxiety go away because it doesn't, it just grows and grows and grows. But by forcing yourself to be exposed to it, you basically become bored of it, weary of it. It stops being frightening, whatever. Mm. So actually, that is like the the gold standard of how it should be treated. He can't have been an idiot, can he? So you must, and and you know what? I I've gotten so much better to the point that I I now wouldn't want to say I have OCD now because I think it would be offensive to people who are really suffering with it. Whereas I just now do reckon, and I know, I think you want to, I completely get why you want to avoid this idea. And, you know, we've talked about David Beckham and everything of there being positives to it. I, at the time of really suffering through it, had no positives, as you said, because it was just so overwhelming. It was just Mm -hmm. so awful. Now that I feel like I would say I don't really have it anymore, those obsessive traits, as as you said yourself, for careers and stuff. I mean, this podcast. I just I, I sleep like two hours, and I, I'm just on it all the time, making every yeah. second. Count. Yeah. And I'm sure it will make me a better editor. I'd like to think than somebody else who just sort of gets it done and throws it out there. So there are, and this is something that uh, Mara Wilson said in your interview. So you do the the OCD chronicles. You interview yeah. people with OCD. How did you speak to Mara? How did you get in touch with her? Well. I think that when people talk about having OCD and once they've got over the scepticism of, oh, is this actually OCD? That mm. We sort of tend to flock, flock to each other, really, because it's so misunderstood that there's such a comfort in, you know, knowing people who have had similar, similar or the same experiences as you. And I think even a woman who was acting in blockbuster films with robin williams when she was a child you know saw me tweeting about ocd and there was a connection there because it was oh well Mm. we share something so we just got a bit pally really and when i started doing the ocd chronicles i just i just reached out to mara and she was really cool about it her book which is kind of like a memoir of being a child star but there's some really powerful stuff in there about OCD. So I should explain as well that she she is. I forgot to mention she was the actress uh, that ev- most people will know from Matilda and Mrs. Doubtfire. Matilda could have gotten in her head at a very young age this idea of your mind being able to control the environment around you. Well, they call that. I mean, in OCD circles, they call it magical thinking, hmm. um, which I certainly have an element of. Like when I was younger, I was obsessed with the number three. If I was nervous about something, giving a talk at school, you know, in a class or uh, filing in an essay, if I was if I was filing an essay, I was nervous about it. I had to put like three dots on every page in the corner, okay. so small that no one would see them. But it would be, oh well, if I don't do that, then yeah. I, I won't get the right grade. Or if I went into an exam hall, I would have to kind of find a spot where my friends weren't around, touch the floor three times with my nose. Which okay. is crazy. Um, and you're aware the whole time you're doing it, this is crazy, right? Is that right for you as well? I think that I think that at the time I sort of thought somehow I was appeasing the cosmos, <laughs> like I think yeah. that was like it sort of made it something else, you know. And what I but what I have been quite good at in my life, and I think it's the reason why it isn't like a principal thing now. I've always been quite good at, when I've had those thoughts of going, James, that's not how the world works, yeah. and that kind of shuts it down. Because I all the time I have things like, you know, to my uh, eternal disgust, I smoke. And if I drop a cigarette in the street, I will go, well, if you don't stand on that, people will think you're a serial killer because I'm sort of making that connection. 
and I have to go, James, and it's not how the world works. And that kind of pretty much, I think, kind of kept that from becoming a real problem. There are people who I know who, you know, if a car drives past and it's yellow, that means they're a paedophile, you know, in in bird comments. Um, and that's, you know, what they would what they would call magical thinking. Hmm. I don't think that was actually Mara's thing, but I can imagine that it was all very confusing for her. It must have been at that age, yeah. Combined with a bunch of other environmental factors and genetics and stuff, mixed with spending a you know a big part of your childhood probably filming Matilda as the central character. No real thing was um, like an obsession of wanting to, to do good. You know, you're a you're on set, you're a kid. You know, I want to get my, my lines right. I want to get my intonation right. You know, I I want to be praised. And again, all those things are totally natural. But when they become an obsession, that becomes a problem. Bloody hell. What can a parent do if they notice their child is uh, perhaps obsessive compulsive or developing these kinds of things? What can they do? I have friends that I sort of see traits in. I would never diagnose them. I mean, I don't have that right or that medical authority. But I do normally, if they're open to it, will send them uh, a link to OCD UK or OCD Action, which are the two big UK charities, or kind of send them like paraphernalia that I read. And when I read it, I identified myself within it and thinking, oh, maybe they will as well. I think that if you're a parent, I would like to say go straight to your GP, but in my experience, I think that the ratio of the GP getting it right isn't 100%. So I would say go straight to one of the charities who are run by incredible people, in my experience. Um, and talk about it with them, and then, depending on what they say, go to GP. Uh, I went to see a GP once about my OCD, and they recommended that I give crochet a try. So forgive me for being a little bit down on that system. (laughs) That was quite heavy at times, but James held it together well, and I'm grateful to him for giving us a poignant insight into the difficulties involved with living with OCD. I felt positive by the end. He, he definitely seems to be dealing with his version of the disorder better all the time. Um, and it's great that he's bringing these, these things to light because, you know, hopefully somebody will stumble across this, somebody suffering with debilitating OCD and, and will feel that they have a better idea of what to do. If you have gone through this stuff and just want to talk about it, find me on andrewgold underscore OK on Twitter or Instagram or just type on the edge with Andrew Gold into Facebook I'm always up for a chat, uh, as many of you will attest to. I could also do with some suggestions for new guests. It is getting a little bit harder. Don't just say David Beckham or Barack Obama uh, or someone else I'd never get through to. Those Twitter and Facebook and Instagram pages also have video versions of the trailers for each episode so you can see what we all look like. Tweet about the pod, tell your friends. Here's an example of a nice tweet I was mentioned in after the prison episode with Bobby, just a couple episodes back. Laura Elliott said, Your thoughtful approach and hearing Bobby's full, moving and emotional recounting was quite emotional. Thank you so much. Another Twitteree, Detroit girl, said, Listened and cried along with Bobby. Stay strong. It is a good episode, that one. If you're on Apple, make sure to leave a review. This week we had Jep715 in the US who said, In a world, well, it does start with in a world, in a world where most of us get our news and general sociopolitical content from within our own algorithm pruned social media bubble, it is extremely refreshing and valuable to find a podcast that neutrally, for the most part, and without judgment, at times to a fault, presents such a diverse spectrum of life experiences and world news. I second the vote for a slightly more critical approach, even if only presented in a playing devil's advocate tone, as I think it would allow for deeper development of the views of each guest. Keep up the great work. Well, that's nice, Jeb. Thank you so much. I hope you're still listening to this one uh, and that you enjoyed it. There were equally intriguing British reviews, right, for British listeners made by British people in Britain by Ruth Hannah Seventy. Adam Maticus and Moody Ham. I would read them all out, but uh, I, d- I don't know how much patience you'll have for me reading out stuff that's nice about me and the podcast. Um, a few of them do mention Louis Theroux um, as a similarity kind of thing. Um, I did get in touch with Louis 
because he's just had a TV series out called Life on the Edge. So I messaged him uh, because he follows this show on on Twitter, which is obviously lovely. Um, and I messaged saying, oh, I see you really liked the podcast name of On the Edge. You know, would you like to maybe come on as a guest? And he did reply, but he was quite busy. So don't expect him in any of the coming episodes. But maybe one day, he did say one day. Uh, oh, and by the way, before I forget... I say in a voice that makes it sound like I haven't planned this whole outro. I've been asked on as a guest to some podcasts. uh, And having been asked, I have gone on to those podcasts and spoken on them and they've been released. So check me out on the Ross Trevina project, right? But you just go to his website. Ross is like Trevena. Um, I never asked him how that's pronounced, actually. Trevena or Trevina. Uh, You'll find it in Google. And... The other one was the Thinking Out Loud podcast by the the YouTube channel Babylon Project. So just like, you know, Google all of that stuff, you'll find it. Uh, I should warn you, I do talk about myself in those a lot. So yeah. Anyway, thanks for sticking around this long. I'll let you get on with your day now and catch you next week.